Welcome to the Gotland Game Talk for Project Managers and to the Game Design Department at Uppsala University. My name is Lina Sors Emilsson. I'm your host today. I'm also a researcher and a teacher in game design for project managers at Campus Gotland. This seminar is actually part of the curriculum for students studying the bachelor program in game design and project management at Uppsala University. However, I'd like to emphasize that this is an open seminar series and where everyone interested is welcome. The format of these seminars is that we will have a 30 minute conversation or I will have a 30 minute convers conversation with a guest about a pre-announced subject. This part of the seminar will be recorded and you can ask your questions in the chat. After 30 minutes, we will stop the recording and go into a shared Q&A session where you can continue to ask your questions in the chat or raise your digital hand and unmute yourself and ask your question. Today, our guest is Jenny Robinson. Jenny is a serial entrepreneur, a leadership scholar and a communication expert. During the last 15 years, she has worked on leadership development and as a mindfulness coach to senior executives. In 2019, Jenny published, together with her colleague Phil Renshaw, Coaching on the Go, a book that offers a unique perspective on coaching skills for leaders by focusing on everyday life situations. Jenny is joining us here today to talk about conflicts at work, how to embrace creative distraction and manage communication and conflicts so that everyone can move forward construct constructively from a disagreement. Welcome, Jenny. Happy to have you here. Hi, thanks for having me. Hello. Uh, let's start that you share a little bit about yourself, about your professional journey and what you work with today and how come you do what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's a long story, so I'll try and break it into some chunks. The first chunk, as you've already referred to, was I started building businesses when I was a teenager. I then built another business in my 20s, another one in my 30s, another one in my 40s. Um, and I've built a couple more since then. So I am, as you say, a serial entrepreneur. Um, one of those businesses, the one I built in my 20s, was quite a big one and I sold it. And I suddenly found that I had a boss and I didn't get on with him very well. And I didn't like that feeling of having a boss. So inevitably I left um, he kept all the money <laughs> and I went back to university and studied so I did uh, organizational behavior organizational psychology and that's led to my lifetime interest in leadership and I've now got a PhD in leadership through my PhD I met Phil Renshaw he's the co-author of the book uh, coaching on the go I've got it behind me and you're talking to Phil I think next month on the Gotland Games uh, series. In between all of those businesses, I also uh, got myself a position with a global consulting firm. So I was with them for 10 years. I traveled the world with them um, as a result of which one of the stories I will tell a bit later is I was kidnapped. Um, it's not a, not a dramatic story, but it will serve to illustrate a few points today. Um, and I also had a few setbacks in my life. And as a result of that, I learned mindfulness. I now teach mindfulness and study mindfulness as well. And on top of all of that, I have an alpaca farm. I think that what kind of people listening here is quite a few that I know that are entrepreneurial. They would love to know what kind of businesses have you met, built before we go into conflict management? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so my first business uh, when I was a kid was a commercial radio station. It is still broadcasting in New Zealand. I uh, founded it with two other colleagues. We were university students. I was in charge of selling advertising. So I literally walked the streets and knocked on doors to sell advertising to fund the radio station. And you can imagine we were in a university town and we were offering uh, a contemporary music. So we were a raging success almost overnight. And I thought that all businesses were that successful all the time. 
Um, the second business I built in the UK was um, a video production company and a, an events production company. And I sold that to WPP PLC. So I found myself in, in a very, very large um, conglomerate. And then I've started uh, two other consulting firms, one of which is with Phil, I've mentioned already. And then, uh, of course, the alpaca farm and all the products and things that come off that. So let's go into conflicts now, because I think all of this, what you told us about, will come back when you can, when you illustrate. But before we start, um, what is a conflict? I think it's kind of important to define what we are talking mm -hmm. about. What is a conflict and what is not a conflict? So I think, I, so these are personal views. I, I actually don't have an academic reference on con conflict in this situation, which is unusual for me. But my way of thinking about conflict is several ways. One is it's about energy that clashes. So think about energy that is clashing. Think about, um, I, I don't know if you know the term Velcro, you know, where you've got uh, Velcro that sticks together. So you you put it together and you can't get it apart. So that's the other picture I have of of conflict. And the other one is of um, sort of not backing down, somebody always needing to win. So th those are the things I have in my mind as part of my working definition of conflict. So how do you know that you have a conflict? Okay, so uh, firstly, how do you know when you you yourself are in conflict and how do you know when you might be observing conflict? So they're two different things. Um, and firstly, I, I, I think it's easy to assume that you know when you are looking at other people. And I think that's dangerous to assume that. So if you are managing other people, if you're in a team with other people and you are watching or observing, um, I think that one of the most helpful things you can do is check your assumptions and um, ask. And the way we ask is with an open question. So one of the things that Phil and I talk about a lot is the, the powerful questions that you can use to unlock a situation. So again, don't go in and say, are you, are you guys in conflict? Because that's a closed question. That means you'll get a yes or no answer. So you, you say, how are things? How are things going? How are you working together? How's this thing progressing? So you ask open questions and then you sit back and listen. So the point number one is don't assume. If you're not involved, don't assume. Then, if you're thinking about from your own point of view, if you're in conflict, I think the thing you will notice is that a part of your ego is attached. Your ego is on the line. And when your ego is attached in some way, then that is taking you down a, a pathway of conflict. So you can have challenging conversations you can have energy that is kind of clashing and and being very creative but it's the ego that is in danger of being damaged in conflict that makes conflict so difficult you talked about not assuming and asking open questions and one of the titles you have is communication expert <laughs> so what does that mean? And what role does communication have in a conflict? I, I'm very wary of calling myself a communication expert. I think that that anybody anybody who says they're a communication expert is immediately going to fail in some ways and people are going to discredit them. So let's let's just drop the expertise label now. Um, but the reason I talk about uh, communication as one of my areas of interest and something I, I'm passionate about is because, firstly, I think communication is all about relationship. It's all about the way that we interact. And what I have tried to do over the course of my career as a leader is break it down into 
into bite-sized pieces, um, which is something I love to do is make things small because then I can study it and then I can slow it down and then I can make more choices. So if we're caught in a cycle of reactivity, boom, 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 it's really hard and not just to repeat the, the same mistake. So with the communications title, what I've tried to do is um, break down what, what goes into this sort of relationship. How could I change it? How could I make a difference? What, what's happening here? So sort of a, a diagnostic, slowing it down, making it small, changing little pieces of it, and then seeing if you get different results. That's kind of the basis of what I've been doing. So regarding communication, do you have something specific you'd like to emphasize more than breaking it down into two chunks when you are in a, in a situation of a conflict or disagreement at work? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, again, I, please, anybody who's really interested in this, read our book because many of the things I'm, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to use uh, concepts concepts very quickly and they they're all expanded in in the book but uh, one of the things about conflict is uh, usually we've gone up a ladder a ladder of logic and we are arguing about a conclusion so I'm at the top of my ladder and somebody else is at the top of their ladder and our ladders are or our egos are in conflict you know we're We've got a conclusion. One of the most important things you can do uh, when you find yourself uh, in that situation is to walk down the ladder. And the way that you walk down that ladder is by using uh, questions. And the way that conflicts get resolved is by getting right down both sides of the ladder, so the other person's ladder and your side of the ladder, do you get to the point where you've got a pool of data that you both agree on? So if you have the same starting point, now you can begin to ladder up with your logic. Ah, that's where we're beginning to see things really differently. So all of these going down the ladder and then coming back up the ladder use the very basic skills of asking questions, listening to each other, really listening to each other, caring about the other person's point of view. Uh, it also is about changing perspective. You've got to be able to look at it from the other side of the, of the argument, the other side of the ladder. But basically, that's what conflict resolution is doing. It's coming down from the top of a ladder all the way down till you get to basic data where you agree, and then you walk up the ladder together. Most people see conflict as something to avoid. Yeah. You don't. <laughs> you think on it. You think on it in a different way. Would you like to expand on this and tell us your thoughts around conflicts? So I'm going to just step back two more steps and bring you into my thinking on this one. Firstly, I think all work is achieved great work, big, big, big pieces of work, work that you're super proud of, the best work that you will do in your life will always be done in collaboration with other people. You know, the, the things that really shine in our life are the things that we have collaborated on. And so collaboration for me is what I'm aiming for. And a little bit of creative energy is is good for collaboration right and creative energy often comes because people are sparking off each other so i want the energy of conflict without the egos of conflict and that's why i see uh sort of creative collaborative endeavors as being energetic clashes minus the ego and then what you can say to each other is we both care about having the very, very best outcome here. And that's what this is all about. It's just about getting the best outcome. 
And the fact that we're sparking doesn't doesn't mean we're in conflict. It it means we're revving up. <laughs> you know, we care. We're engaged. We're alive. You know, it 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 can be the most amazing thing to to kind of um, really energetically in, uh, put your points across uh, to each other. It could it might be quite forceful. It might be quite blunt, but because you both are committed to this idea that the final product will be better and that you've both got something to contribute. I, I think it's the most fun in the world. And um, an example was uh, Phil and I writing this book and uh, another business partner and I in another situation, we, we go at it. You know, we're really, really going at it. And every time I remember us doing that, we came out with something really satisfying, really collaborative. And I think actually even in the book, there's one part where we we wrote a section where we said, you know what, we, we talked about this, we argued about this, we couldn't decide, you know, which view we preferred. So in the end, we've decided we're going to give you both views. So Phil says this and Jenny says this, and here are the pros and cons of both points of view, you decide. I, th I I was just, I thought that was fantastic. So let me bring us back to project management because mm -hmm. we have a, quite a bit of project manager, becoming project manager is in the room today. So how can you work in a team and work with a team to be on this line between constructive, mm -hmm. creative construction <laughs> and not going into an ego conflict, as you put it. So how can, you know, first of all, as a person, how can you manage this when you feel that you are tipping over into the other mm -hmm. side where you like start to defend instead mm -hmm. of, and how can you as a manager, when you see your team moving mm -hmm. that, how can you, how do you, what are your suggestions? What are your thoughts around this? Mm. Um, Self-awareness is key. You have to have sort of a metacognitive approach. You have to have, uh, if you like, the video camera outside of your head that watches you. You know, that's something that um, as a species humans can do. We can move outside of ourselves and watch ourselves. That's part of developing self-awareness. And when we notice that we are getting into patterns of reactivity, and I'm going to ask you, Lena, to talk a bit about the neuroscience of this reactivity, but it is because we're hooked. You know, uh, something about us has been hooked, and we are then, um, uh, it, it's down to us to take action to unhook ourselves. So I would say things like take a deep breath, take what we call a pause point, you know, just stop for a moment. Um, if you're really in conflict with somebody, you can actually call a timeout. You can say, this is unhelpful. We need to take two minutes each to breathe and, and just step away and come back. So it doesn't have to be a long time. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. But it, if if you don't stop, you're just going to stay on that hook and there's very good reasons for that which Lena you might want to talk about the neuroscience of because you know we're we're um we're captivated by our neuroscience yeah we have a biology so yeah. for everyone who doesn't know me I'm a neuroscientist by background and and I I think that this is one of the part that brought me to management is our neurological system how we have system that kicks in in a situation of threat and we have basically three parts that we go into we are either we freeze and we can't do anything or we just get out of there and leave you know flee or we put up a fight and we attack this is kind of you know all species have these reactions and they are part of what we call the sympathetic nervous system that kicks in and for me adding on to, to what you are talking about is the, the power of being able to identify this, 
these biological processes that goes on and you recognize them with you know high adrenaline mm -hmm. higher blood or, or brain you know uh, heartbeats uh, when you're tem trembling a bit all of these and your thoughts cannot really be focused then it's time to stop and just make movements in yourself take activities that bring you from that state into the other system nervous system we have that is the parasympathetic which is like we have when we are in rest and relaxation and though and you can do that you can do that by breathing as you said so it, it's actually really much connected and i find this super helpful to think about the biology behind our reactions to be able to you know change our reaction around mm. so we don't follow this flee fight or freeze situation we have that we more go into uh, breathing. And my best tip is, you know, if you need a break, nobody can ever stop you to go to the toilet, you know? You know, then you get this break that you might need for yourself to be a better better, better person in that situation. So yeah, I don't know if that was what you were, you were looking for, Jenny, yeah, but no, that that's would be my- that, That's exactly right. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, as soon as you have adrenaline running around your system, you're kind of doomed. <laughs> yeah, you know, you've lost your capacity to think creatively and to really collaborate. Um, so do anything that you can to reduce that level of reactivity and come back into the conversation again. Yeah. I think uh, you're a coach in mindfulness. And I think actually mindfulness is just about changing these biological trajectories that you go into. Would you agree with me with that? And would you like to talk about what it means to be coaching in mindfulness in a conflict situation? Uh, so, um, so mindfulness comes with um, several um, general principles that are super helpful in a conflict situation. It takes a little, little bit of um, practice to sort of embody those principles. But the principles are firstly, this acknowledgement, this deep acknowledgement that we are all interconnected. So you can understand how that fundamentally changes the ground on which you might argue with anybody you know conflict is about argument and an argument is about the separation between the two of you whereas mindfulness is saying we're, we're the same you know we're human beings we have the same hopes and fears we have the same um, ambitions we have the same um, biology so let's think about more about what we have in common than what we have in difference. So that would be one thing. And the other thing that mindfulness powerfully teaches us is that everything sh shifts and everything changes. And so one of the things that happens in conflict is that people won't disentangle and they won't let go. And actually, when you realize that everything is shifting, everything is moving, nothing stays the same, it makes it easier to disentangle yourself. It makes it easier for you to just stop. Um, and just to link this back to martial arts, so for a long time, I studied something called Aikido. And Aikido is known to be um, one of those elusive uh, martial arts that came out of Japan uh, where it looks like you're doing nothing, you know, it's just all sort of circular and it looks all tidy and there's nobody breaks a sweat or anything. And the principles of Aikido are the same as the principles of um, mindfulness and conflict resolution, if you like, which is um, you just can't have a fight with a cloud. <laughs> you, know, you, just, you just can't fight a cloud. <laughs> you know? And so it's, it's that same idea of, okay, it, I, if I just stop, and stopping doesn't mean giving way or giving up, it just means I'm allowing a little bit of time to, uh, to move things forward without me doing that movement, moving. You know, the process of life will move it forward. The process of life will bring about change. I don't need to be, I don't need to be exerting all that energy all the time. 
So it's a bit more esoteric, but it is a different mindset. It, it helps us to remove our ego and it helps us to see that conflict is not about winning. You know, good conflict is about um, this energy that raises us up, that helps us to collaborate, that brings about creativity. So let me throw you into a situation, Jenny, <laughs> to give our listener a little bit of a feeling of how to practically go about a situation of trust. And I would like to give you a group where you have a low trust situation. So if you are in a group where the trust is very low, there is a lot of egos going on. And what would you how what are your recommendations for a person coming in as an external actor to be able to be a powerful and and empowering uh, source for this team or this group to to move forward to get everyone in the group out of the conflict and the disagreement with their you know with their dignity and with respect mm -hmm. yeah uh, what are your concrete like how would you work around that uh, so I have been in this situation, there was a huge industrial strike action in the UK, in fact there were two, and I was, I was invited in as the external actor, because uh, the classic way of dealing with strikes had failed, and I did nothing else, but I spent a week uh, shuffling around the different groups of stakeholders, uh, holding what I call listening posts, which was, I just sat there and I listened. What's wrong and what do you want? What's wrong and what do you want? What's wrong, what do you want? What's wrong, what, what do you want? And um, honestly, when people have the opportunity to be listened to in a way that is respectful of their needs, they will um, talk themselves out it's very interesting that um, a lot of leaders are very scared to listen because what happens is the first, uh, the first thing that happens is a lot of stuff comes out and it feels overwhelming and it feels like we've got to solve everything. Firstly, when you're listening, you, you're not solving, you're just listening, you're there to understand. And so leaders often start listening and then close it down and of course the very act of closing it down has breached that the trust that was nascent you know the trust that was beginning to grow is immediately stifled because the leader has closed it down if you have the courage and uh, if you possibly can set aside your need to fix things and get things back on track and um, restore the timetable and everything else if you can just do that listening people will talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and then they'll end up consolidating very precisely around a, a narrow set of uh, requirements or a narrow set of uh, things that that they are actually needing and then if you do that enough you find that there's a common point uh, for people to agree on okay that's the point where we agree and um Phil and I call this naming, so the ability to then say, ah, so that's what's really at stake. That's what we're trying to resolve, or that's what we're trying to uh, work towards. And it 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 just, it, it's got to be m much more organic and much more emergent than usually we allow for. We want to do these things quickly in a one hour meeting, uh, to a timetable. Uh, we don't like when it gets messy. We don't like when it, we can't solve everything and tie a little bow on it. Um, and so we then make things worse by trying to move too fast and by pretending that we understand. So we are almost reaching half an hour, but before yes. we go into the Q&A session, there is one more question I'd like to ask you. And when we have the opposite situation, we have a team or a group with a high trust. Can we assume that conflicts will be okay then? No, never assume. <laughs> never assume. No. Yeah, you've got you've got to be um, uh, you've got to be checking and asking and um, 
Oh, if you're engaged in it yourself, watching your own ego, watching watching if you have uh, a need to win, if you have a need to dominate, if you have a need to fix or anything like that. Um, and then you've got to check in with everybody else about how they're seeing things, how they're experiencing it. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, it, it, it can be the most exhilarating thing that you do as a team is to learn to disagree in a way that's creative. So let's end before we go into the Q&A with some good tips for everyone here for the future situation that they will find them in, which will be different for everyone. Mm. Are there some key points you want to send forward with them to, to have in their minds when they find themselves in this situation where the hearts start pumping and you know the thoughts get really yeah. quick and you even start sh shaking and you may even want to go into a cry, which also is like, you know, very human. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so learn something called the stuck record technique. So the stuck record technique is a, a positive um, statement of intention, which you relate to the entire team. So a stuck, I wrote down a stuck record for me would be, uh, you know, I have complete confidence that we're going to work this out as a team. You know, and I, uh, you call it stuck record because you say it again, and then you say it again, and then you say it again, and then you say it again, and you just watch it kind of it helps everybody to go, oh, yes, as long as we hold on to that confidence that we're going to work this out as a team, you know, we can have tears and tantrums and we can have all of that. And, and we're still going to hold everybody in, in a respectful, um, trusting relationship. It's really important that people feel that they are respected and that it, it's a trusting relationship. So learn the stuck record technique. Make sure you understand the technique I was talking about earlier, the ladder. Go down a ladder until you find base data that everybody agrees on. And base data can be um, a, a feeling data. So feeling data is also uh, as valid. I don't just be numbers data. I, I mean, you know, stuff we all agree on. Okay. Um, learn to begin to find... Uh, ways of painting a, a picture of the future that everybody can agree on. So you can agree we're here and everybody can agree we want to get to to here. Okay, so really what we're, what we're really discussing is how, you know, you want to go that way, I want to go that way. Okay, no big deal really. We've agreed the two, two key parts, where we start and where we're finished. So that's great. And then you can also get used to asking people about Okay, what would our guiding principles be that would get us from here to there? So again, you're not naming what the part, exact pathway is, but you're you're asking people to agree. Okay, the principles are important. Okay, the principles are, let's say, the principles of fairness, the principles of inclusion, the principles of um, fun. You know, those may be three principles everybody agrees with stop there you've made great progress okay see you next week or see you tomorrow whatever because you've now made progress okay good time to stop everybody's everybody's feeling like yeah we, we're getting there okay I can see that we're out of time I've got to stop <laughs> <laughs> thank you Jenny thank you for sharing your thoughts and your experience with us uh, before we go into the Q&A session, uh, I'd like to announce our next Scotland Game Talk for project managers, which will take place on the 18th of November, when we will meet Phil Renshaw, a management and executive coach, and as previously mentioned, your co-author for the book Coaching on the Go. We will meet Phil to talk about how to unite leading and coaching skills to develop your team, team and its members. We will also uh, talk about le the learnings in your book, coaching on the go that provides tools on how to coach your team in 10 minutes per day. <laughs>